This is Just Asking Questions, a show for inquiring minds on reason. Why has FDR's dark side stayed hidden? Just Asking Questions. I'm Zach Weissmuller, senior producer for Reason. Sadly, Liz Wolf is out sick today, but should rejoin us next week. She did want me to let you all know that she would have loved to sit in and bash FDR for a little bit, but unfortunately, health events say otherwise. Scholars consistently rank FDR as one of America's greatest presidents. The 2024 Presidential Greatness Project expert survey of presidential scholars ranked him number two below Lincoln. And respondents to the Siena College Research Institute have ranked him number one in six out of the past seven survey years. Perhaps it's understandable that the longest serving president who saw the country through the Great Depression and and a World War II victory would rank so highly. But Do presidential scholars exhibit a major blind spot when it comes to the authoritarian aspects of FDR and his New Deal agenda? That's what today's guest argues in his book, The New Deal's War on the Bill of Rights, the untold story of FDR's concentration camps, censorship, and mass surveillance. Today, we're going to talk about each of those civil liberties abuses, how those abuses permanently changed America and the relationship between citizen and state, and the ways in which FDR directly facilitated those abuses. The book's author, David Beto, is an American historian and history professor at the University of Alabama and a research fellow at the Independent Institute. David, thank you for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. Before we delve into the specific civil liberties abuses that unfolded during the New Deal era, I wanted to ask you about that historical consensus about FDR as an inarguably great president. What are some of the key facts that you think more people need to understand in order to see a fuller picture of FDR and the New Deal era? Well, the first thing that could be said about FDR is that uh, most of the historians doing the ranking, and again, I don't think this is intentional on their part, but they're sympathetic to what FDR was doing. They're sympathetic Mm -hmm. to the rise of the welfare state. That's the chief example. And so they kind of look past things. Uh, FDR was also very different than someone like Trump in that he he would do these, a lot of these things were done behind the scenes. Um, FDR was not the kind of guy to go out there and just attack individuals. Um, If he wanted to do his attack, it was, again, uh, in the shadows very often. And I'm not sure if I'm answering the rest of your question. Um, why don't you remind Well, it's me? interesting that you bring up uh, Trump in your answer. Uh, were there, are, are there parallels or similarities that you see between them? You're, you're saying they're different in how they uh, executed their plans, but it, it implies that maybe there's some sort of similarity in character or governing style. Oh, very. There are many similarities. One was one was that um, FDR's method, one of his chief methods was to bypass the media, which he Mm. attacked. The print media of his day was generally against him. He attacked the print media for printing fake news, misleading information. He would talk to reporters. He'd say, I like you guys, but I know you're told what to write. Right. So there was that kind of aspect, the parallel. And to get around that, we had Trump years ago went to Twitter. That's how he got his breakthrough. He was able to go around the media. FDR is able to go around the media through radio, uh, through Mm -hmm. his fireside chats, through basically uh, an expectation that if he had a speech to give, not only him, but other people around him, uh, they could they could give it. And they could break into existing network programming and so forth. So he is able to to give his fireside chats, which are unfiltered, right? He just gives it directly. There's no press conference. There were no, well, there were press conferences, but they weren't, they weren't uh, broadcast, right? They, he had them, but you, you know, you don't have that kind of give and take 
with the press, and you especially don't have it with FDR in public, unless it's very much stage managed. There was, uh, we've pulled a couple clips from his fireside chats. There's one that I want to play right now because you, since you brought it up, um, and it pertains specifically to FDR's suspicion of the media and in particular his concern that there was kind of, you know, anti FDR, anti New Deal propaganda being seeded by foreign agents. And so that, that, that seemed to be a big aspect of his mm -hmm. suspicion of the media. Uh, Ian, could you roll the uh, fireside chat? One of the principal weapons of our enemies in the past has been their use of what is called the war of nerves. They have spread falsehood and terror. They have started fifth columns everywhere. They have duped the innocent. They have fomented suspicion and hate between neighbors. They have aided and abetted those people in other nations, including our own whose words and deeds are advertised from Berlin and Tokyo as proof of our disunity. The greatest defense against all such propaganda, of course, is the common sense of the common people. So, I mean, your book just, it gave me a fascinating and kind of horrifying new understanding of FDR's complete dominance of radio. Uh, and part of that was had to do with the way that he weaponized the FCC to ensure that dominance. Uh, but like when you imagine uh, from a 21st century vantage point, the the fireside chat, it's got this folksy kind of feel to it. A family sitting around the fireside listening to FDR uh, kind of give them the new his take on the events of the day. Uh, but you point out that he was on 400 out of the 700 stations, basically blasting New Deal propaganda that was impossible to escape in an era when there were not a whole lot of other listening options. Could you tell me a little bit about the regulatory mechanisms that FDR harnessed to really dominate radio? Well, one one illustration before I answer that of the domination, yeah. the degree of do domination. The print press, as I said, was mostly anti-FDR. By 1938, there is not a single anti-FDR commentator on network radio, which is where mm -hmm. most people got their news at the time. Uh, I mean, if they listen to radio, that's where they listen to for the most part in terms of radio listening hours. So he completely dominates it. Now, if you look at the smaller independent stations, there is some leeway there. Even that is somewhat limited. Now, how does he control it? Well, it's 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 very complicated. Uh, for one thing, you have the FCC, originally called the Federal Radio Commission, and that was set up under Coolidge. And Hoover. Hoover was the big guy pushing that, but Hoover was inept in the use of radio. So FDR is able to use that. They have, for example, a rule. Uh, uh, I think the official rule is like two years, uh, license renewals, and they shorten it to like six months, right? Mm -hmm. So this is commented on repeatedly where, where stations were just in terror. They were on eggshells. And they were constantly going to the authorities. Is this all right or is this all right, et cetera. Another thing is a kind of an equal time rule. It hadn't really developed in a kind of um, modern sense, but it was there. And it was, you know, showed up in court decisions and that kind of thing. It was an expectation that if you had, uh, say, you know, an alternative point of view, uh, you would... Uh, you would provide equal time, and this made uh, stations very skittish. There was an uh, organization called the National Association of Broadcasters, and basically they worked in partnership with the, with the FCC. And one thing that they prohibited was using stations as sort of personal voices. So if you had an Elon Musk in 1937 and he bought a radio station, he is not, and the FCC will back this up, he is not supposed to use that station to editorialize for his point of view. Certainly hmm. not if he does not give, uh, um, you know, equal time. But even, it's, it's just considered unseemly. 
Um, so you have the so the effect. I mean, the effect there, just to interject, is that no independent commentator can go on there and criticize FDR, the New Deal, but uh, he has the power of the microphone to go and say whatever he wants, whatever message he wants to broadcast to millions of Americans. Certainly, that is very much the case on network radio. Now, another thing is more behind the scenes more extra legal, and this would be very familiar to us who've read the, the Twitter files. Uh, there was one anti-FDR radio commentator that was very popular. His name was Bo Carter. Carter had supported FDR, but he turned against him during the whole court packing thing in 1937 and became more and more critical. So how do they get him off the air? Well, they investigate his citizenship. He was Canadian-born. They couldn't get him there. They look into his taxes. They really couldn't get him there. So finally, they had the bright idea. This was, I think, NBC. Let's go and exert pressure through advertisers. And a leading advertiser was, uh, you know, the, a company owned by Mar Marjorie Merriweather Post, the original owner of Miralago, by the way. Um, and she uh, was her husband was the Soviet ambassador, American ambassador to the Soviet Union, kind of a notorious figure. But in any case, she uh, they went to her. She was a leading Democratic donor. And they said, could you help us out? And she exerted pressure on the network, which was only too willing to to help, to essentially say he's got to tone it down. Um, and he toned it down so much that he he sort of lost his competitive edge and he was. He's basically forced off the air. Um, there were other stories like that. But Carter was was kind of the a, a key figure of someone who'd been at the top. He was on like three days a week on network radio. He was, you know, highly rated figure. Yeah. Could Millions you talk about to him. What, one of the striking examples is this radio program, the American Family Robinson, uh, which seems like uh, it, it was kind of like a soap opera for the radio, but I guess had very strong free market, free enterprise views, which cut against what the New Deal was trying to accomplish. What happened to that program? Yeah. In fact, I've been thinking of writing an article about it for Reason Magazine because stuff's been written about it, but it, it, it frankly, I, I don't think it tells the whole story. Well, as I mentioned, there is some leeway for the smaller independent stations, and there, you know, there are hundreds of them right? They don't dominate the airwaves like the networks do. But you have this uh, National Association of Manufacturers writes a radio soap opera called The American Family Robinson. And basically, it's an anti-New Deal soap opera. And they make transcriptions, these giant records, and they send them around to all these stations. And they say, you know, uh, basically, here, here's some free content for you. Um, they try to kind of sell it as a public service kind of thing to some extent, but it's a it's a pretty well done show. It's like a, a, a continuing story. It's got plot lines that don't necessarily have much to do with politics. But then it's you know, it's got this editor of a newspaper and he gives these anti has this anti New Deal commentator. And it's it's something that I always wondered if Ayn Rand might have listened to it, because if you listen to it at its height, it sounds a lot like something Rand would love. And it was picked up by a lot of these small independent stations. It's time to join the American Family Robinson again in Centerville. Hey, you ever done any manufacturing? No, but I, I probably could if I put my mind on it. Yeah, you could. Not in a million years. That's just the trouble. We got contact managers thinking they can build factories and professors running business and a pack of young smart aleck lawyers trying to run the whole government. There's only one thing those people can do to have help business recovery. And that's the same thing a blacksmith would do if you took your watch to him to be repaired. He'd leave it alone. There never was a forced reform in this world that didn't end up in a deform. Do you actually mean you like the existing system? To have to work as hard as you do for the little you get, and at the same time have a class of idle rich going... Yeah, yeah, I know all about that. And I've heard that gag about restoring recovery by soaking the rich, too. And it must be a gag... Nobody would seriously propose to restore life to business by knocking the daylights out of it. Well, what ha ends up happening is there are complaints about the, the, this. This is uh, propaganda. And there's more and more pressure 
uh, put it on these local stations. And the response of the people doing the show is basically to water it down. So it's very interesting. I've listened to the shows that are out there, and there are, I don't know, a couple dozen of them. Um, and if you listen to the early ones, it's, wow, this is pretty hard-hitting stuff. The later ones are these innocuous plot lines. It's like, what's your, what are you trying to do here, right? <laughs> what's your point? But it was a very popular show, um, and it, it's worth listening to if, if anyone, you know, you can just go online and listen to these shows. Um, and, and it's pretty high quality, frankly. Um, and they just you know, they put some it money down. into it, and uh, it, yeah. you know, some good writing. In fact, one of the writers, I always want to tell her story, was a very good friend in Florida of Zora Neale Hurston. In fact, mm. she saved. It was a libertarian, African American, libertarian yes. leaning. Uh, their writer. eyes were watching she, God. Her fam- Hurston's novel. Paper, Hurston was destitute. Uh, you know, when she died, and her papers are being burned, and this woman saved the papers. And she was a good hmm. friend of her. So I always been interesting if those two sat around and talked politics. But she was the a writer, one of the writers for this radio show back in the 30s. Yeah. I mean, the striking thing about th- this sort of story and many others like it is the sort of indirect pressure that seemed to be applied. There was always a lot of stuff that seems to be happening behind the scenes Um it, it's difficult at times to draw, to find the breadcrumbs leading directly to FDR, although sometimes they are there. Um, you brought up the Twitter files. This is kind of like there there is a kind of analog here where it's like we're trying now to grope our way through this question of like, when does the government cross the line from just having conversations with the tech companies to they're actually exerting a real tangible pressure or what we call jawbone, we've come to call jawboning now. Um, Could you talk a little bit about the methods that FDR and his administration was using and that kind of indirect pressure? Well, he would go to his secretary of the treasury, but I mean, this stuff wasn't necessarily recorded in official action. He'd say, look in this Look into this guy's taxes. Somebody should look closely into this. And you had to be, if you were a critic of FDR, you had to be very careful in your taxes because uh, that was that was all often a threat. The reason we yeah. know about Bo Carter, the threat to, about his um, uh, citizenship and some other things, is FDR let his hair down at a, you know, a retreat where he was talking to a very pro-New Deal guy, big defender of the New Deal. I forgot what his name was. Uh, but this guy was appalled because FDR said, we have to find some way to get Bo Carter off the air. We're looking into this. We're doing investigations because he thought he could he could trust this. Another another guy he talked to was Raymond Moley, who was one of the key brains trusters. And Raymond Moley was complaining about some of the methods of one of FDR's allies, Senator Black. And FDR was like defending you know, these these really unseemly methods, probably because he thought he could trust him. There are occasionally um, uh, uh, we, we we have one interesting example of where we have the un, what I call the unfiltered FDR that everybody can listen to. In 1940, there was uh, FDR was running against Wendell Wilkie and Wilkie was having an affair with a woman by the way, would have been an Isabel Patterson's boss, who was the head of the edit, the head of the book section of the New York, oh God, what was it? New York Evening News, New York Post, whatever. Very influential figure. And he was having this affair. And Roosevelt was talking on tape because he taped some of his, he had a taping system in the White House. Mm -hmm. And by accident, the tapes picked him up with this conversation with one of his close advisors. And they said, we have to get this out about the affair. But how do we do it? So we can't have it connected to us. We got to release it to our people down the line. That's all I'm talking about. Not us. People down the line. And it's you can (laughs) listen to it. It's it's up online. Um, And uh, that is an example of the kinds of methods he was used behind the scenes acting through third parties uh and he's very slippery in that sense and that's why i guess it's so easy to uh, to not pay attention to it i mean you saw that you had that clip but he doesn't say things like 
that a lot, right? They're that close. Even there, there's sort of, you know, some wiggle room. Yeah, I mean, but in that clip, who is he? What is, can you just put us in his mindset for a second when he's talking about this fifth column and these propagandists? Um, this is in 1942, uh, that clip. Um, what, what is going, what do you think is kind of going through his head? What is motivating that kind of rhetoric? Well, okay, here's his mindset at that very time in American history. Uh, uh, FD FDR was very, had a very, there was a very strong opposition to U.S. Uh, support for the British and U.S. involvement in World War II, as everybody knows. Um, and this included some big metropolitan newspapers like the New York, the so-called Patterson McCormick Access. These were mm -hmm. two cousins that ran three of the biggest papers in the country. And they were critical of his policies and foreign policy and so forth. There's people like Charles Lindbergh, head of the America First Committee. And there were others, prominent figures. Well, when Pearl Harbor occurs, the attack on Pearl Harbor, just about all these people uh, pledge their support to the administration. Lindbergh tries to volunteer. They don't really let him, and he does it informally. Uh, Patterson, who was an old friend of FDR, had turned against him on foreign policy, goes to the Ro Roosevelt and tries to volunteer his services, only to be spurned by Roosevelt. Um, so, okay, Roosevelt in 1942 is still smarting from this, this opposition by these people. He's thinking that they are somehow fifth columnists, even though a lot of them have been sort of Democratic supporters for many years. And he wants them prosecuted. He is constantly putting pressure on his attorney general, saying, can't you find something on the American First Committee? Can't you find some evidence that they are they were getting their, uh, you know, uh, their ideas from Nazi Germany before the war? And, you know, Biddle looks into this and he can't really find anything. His attorney general, his name is Francis Biddle. And mm -hmm. Roosevelt, he keeps holding him off. And this is one of the more hopeful aspects of the story I tell is that key people in the Roosevelt administration were pushing back. But he wanted to prosecute them. He wanted to go after these big newspaper publishers, these big names. He has held off. So Biddle finally gives him what he wants, but only in a watered-down way. There's a big mass sedition trial. That's all making it come back, too, isn't it? In Washington, yep. where they have 30-plus defendants. But these are small fry, and they are, by and large, like guys that would, you know, some old guy that was an old populist who, you know, is kind of anti-Semitic and had a newsletter in rural Nebraska, you know, and they would be these cranks and he'd scoop for the most part and he scooped them all because for the most part, they weren't including groups like the Boone. They'd scoop them up and, and did this big prosecution of them. But there is constant pressure from the left and from FDR on his Department of Justice to to prosecute these big names. And yeah. to his credit, I have some criticism of it, FDR's attorney general and people immediately under him don't want to do this. They, they don't. Yeah. They, and why? Because I think that they went to law school at a time where the lessons of World War I were still fresh. And mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they really are worried about hysteria. They're worried about repeating World War I. FDR is not. <laughs> He was yeah. with that uh, yeah, I mean, you you yeah, reference yeah. in the you reference <laughs> in there that during during World War One, during the Wilson administration, FDR was all about it. He was writing letters to federal prosecutors congratulating them for their prosecutions of uh, dissenters, anti-war dissenters and, and so forth. So this seems this was not, uh, you know, he was not a Johnny come lately to this. This was something that he was saw it kind of as an extension of what Wilson was doing during World War I. Is that more or less accurate? Yeah, the two most important yeah. figures in FDR's uh, political development were his, his cousin, Theodore, very distant cousin, who he referred to as Uncle Ted, who actually did kind of literally become his uncle because he married his niece, Eleanor. Um, he looked up to him, and his career tra trajectory was a lot like Uncle Ted, Uncle Ted gave away the bride at the wedding. You know, they, they were pretty close. And the mm -hmm. other figure, interestingly enough, is a Democrat, Woodrow Wilson. 
And Will and Roosevelt have been uh, what they call an original Wilson man, meaning he was one of the earliest supporters of Wilson. Um, and got his reward as Assistant Secretary of Navy. Here is a guy that was like a kind of a, close to a freshman in the New York State Legislature, and he's he's promoted up to Assistant Secretary of Navy. That's what he wanted to do, and that's what he got, and that's what Uncle Ted had done too, as part of his career. Uh, trajectory. So during the war, he's very supportive of Wilson's policies towards civil liberties. And there's one guy that uh, kind of an anarchist who's criti criticizing Roosevelt has a little newsletter and he's criticizing Rose. He's implying that there's something funny about the fact that here's a guy in his 30s in good health, apparently, and he was at that time, who's not in uniform. Why is that? He's assistant secretary of Navy. Well, they get somebody older to do that. Why isn't he in uniform? And Roosevelt's so mad that he writes to the state, uh, the federal district attorney in um, Atlanta and says, why can't you prosecute this guy for this? And the guy writes back and says, well, we, you know, we really don't have enough evidence. I mean, this during the Wilson administration, <laughs> but we can't, you know, do that just for, for that reason. Uh, uh, so he is not a civil libertarian. Now, there is a civil libertarian aspect on the left. On the, there are civil, new dealers that are civil libertarians, but Roosevelt is not in that tradition, although he'll occasionally give lip service to it. Yeah, let's uh, look at some of that lip, lip service uh, in a second. But, um, you know, the this resistance that you mentioned, both kind of within his own administration and from the left outside of his administration, um, there was um, there there was resistance uh, and some restraint on him, but you like putting ourselves in that mindset of he's still got the microphone, he's still got the most powerful bully pulpit uh, up to that point ever, and you can just imagine the chilling effect that would have on dissenters, regardless of whether concrete action is being taken against them or not when there's the threat and then you've got fdr dominating the radio stations you know putting you uh in the crosshairs that's that's got to have an effect um well, yeah, and we're I, gonna oh go ahead yeah go ahead yeah oh i was just saying uh, i was just thinking that a key example that exactly is 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 related to your point was the black press the black press during world war ii had a lot of had a lot of readers chicago Daily Defender, Pittsburgh Courier, Rose Walter Lane wrote for that paper, um, and so forth. These papers have a lot of circulation, and they're very, very critical of the government at the beginning of the war. They have the idea of the double V campaign, meaning we're not going to be quiet about oppression at home just because we're fighting the Nazis. And they're, they're, they're criticizing the federal government and, and, and segregation in the federal government and all that. Attur the Attorney General... Maybe I got to take back some of my praise. Biddle calls in uh, uh, some people from the black press, and he basically threatens to prosecute them for sedition. This is sedition, and they come up with a deal because the government, the federal government, knows they really can't shut down the black press. They're trying to win the black vote for God's sake. You know, that's just not going to look good. That's that's hundreds of thousands of readers. So they make a deal, and the deal is the following that the black press will tone down its criticisms of the federal government. It can still attack segregation and, you know, Ford Motor Company or whatever, but it, it cannot attack, it should not attack the federal government. It needs to tone that down. In return, the black press got a promise that uh, the key black journalists, that they would, they would get scoops. Well, the government didn't keep its word. It didn't give them scoops, kind of froze them out. The black press, mm -hmm. though, did keep its word. It toned down. And you can see a real change. So that's a very subtle method. But there were there was coercion involved in that because the FBI, you know, would come by occasionally and, you know, ask questions. And, you know, how you doing? And uh, we're a little worried about some of this stuff. And they were intimidated. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that's I mean, that's a very there are many examples like that in the book. I can't keep shut up about them because there are so many. But that's a, that's a very important one. That's very well documented by. Historians yeah. Well, I, and I want to I want to take us to 
I want to take us to some of the more direct methods that were used to quash dissent, uh, namely uh, Senate investigations, Senate committees. But before we do that, uh, I would like to play a clip from one of FDR's most famous speeches, which is known as the Four Freedoms speech. It was the State of the Union delivered at the beginning of his unprecedented third term in 1941. Let's listen to a bit of that because he talks about free speech at the beginning of the clip. The first is freedom of speech and expression everywhere in the world. The second is freedom of every person to worship God in his own way everywhere in the world. The third is freedom from want, which translated into world terms means economic understandings which will secure to every nation a healthy peacetime life for its inhabitants everywhere in the world. The fourth is freedom from fear which translated into world terms means a worldwide reduction of armaments to such a point and in such a thorough fashion that no nation will be in a position to commit an act of physical aggression against any neighbor anywhere in the world. First of all, let's just Note that he's obviously an incredibly talented orator, yes. um, and you, that that comes through in that clip and in a lot of these uh, fireside chats that I was listening to in preparation for this. Uh, you can see why he was able to dominate radio because he's just very very skilled at verbal communication. Mm -hmm. Um, but the very first item that he mentions is freedom of speech as one of the four freedoms. That's the first freedom. Given what we've already talked about and the kind of unprecedented assault on freedom of speech we're about to talk about, what do you make of that contradiction? Well, it is quite a contradiction. And, and Roosevelt, at the beginning of his administration, really wasn't talking about stuff like that. There was a very famous example in the late 30s. There was a mayor of Jersey City who okay, used all these strong-arm tactics. He was a ro ally of Roosevelt, and Roosevelt didn't want to turn against him. But it was such pressure that basically Roosevelt sort of had a little bit of a shift in his rhetoric, and he starts uh, catering more rhetorically to the pro-free speech, civil libertarian element of the party who feel completely sidelined. So this comes out of that to some extent. Now, what's interesting about this is this occurs at the precise time that in the city of Memphis, there is a leading black Republican figure in Memphis named uh, 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 J.B. Martin. He's also the president of the Negro Baseball League. And Martin, in November 1940, just three months before this, thinks that maybe, just maybe, Wilkie will win. And some polls show him ahead. Wilkie's pro-civil rights. And he thinks maybe he could carry Memphis for Wilkie or at least carry Tennessee for Wilkie because it had gone Republican in the 20s. And so he organizes a multiracial rally. This is at a time, by the way, when blacks in Memphis could vote and were mostly Republican. And he organizes a multiracial rally of a thousand people right before the election, week before the election. And he's feeling really good. There's a big city boss who runs Memphis named Edward Crump, a very close ally of FDR. Again, it's like FDR vis-a-vis -vis Wilson. Crump was there at the beginning. He was at power conventions and uh, got a lot of New Deal money. And Crump is mad. And he basically sends a message through a third person saying to Martin, you are planning to do another rally like that? No, do not do that. You don't do the rally. And you shut down Republican Party headquarters in Shelby County, which he had it. And you resign as chair. Otherwise, I will police you. 
All right. What does that mean? Wow. Well, Martin probably knew it was going to be good, but he went ahead with the rally. And just that evening, his drugstore, which was the, probably the leading black owned drugstore in the South, every customer who goes in and out of that drugstore is being searched. Uh, the Republican Party had a banner that they are ordered to take down, which was Joe Lewis supports Wilkie. Uh, basically, uh, there is systematic harassment against all the Republican leaders. Everybody going into the drugstore is searched. There are raids, there are arrests. Uh, and uh, uh, basically, Martin realizes that about the time this speech is made, maybe a little bit before, that uh, he's going to be, the, Trump's going to put him in the workhouse on some trumped up charges. So he leaves Memphis. He returns one time in 1943 to go to a baseball game at a stadium he built. It was the Martin Stadium in Memphis. He goes mm-hmm. up to the presidential box. He's watching the game just to visit and see one game because he owned the, you know, he owned the team, for God's sakes. He was president of the league. The Crumps police, Crumps orders the police to come up to the presidential box. They take him out of it and they put him in a holding cell and they basically tell him, get out of Memphis and don't come back. And he doesn't. Mm. Um, so this is going on at the very same time that FDR has, has his flowery prose, which always struck me as is sort of interesting. There's also a very famous thing during this period about free speech that the federal government, a famous radio show that the federal government promotes. And I always sort of wonder, well, what if this Martin guy heard this stuff? What he would, would he think of it? Um, so this story of J.B. Martin, I don't think has been told a lot. It's been told by local historians, but it's just incredible. It's yeah. just an incredible how much, example. How much of uh, incidents like that can be traced directly to FDR or his influence versus, you know, the local, the party machines of the time that I'm sure existed on both sides of the aisle. Is this somehow, does this somehow directly implicate FDR um, or is it really a story of just the corrupt party politics of the time? That's a very good point. And does it directly implicate him? Not that per se. Do I think FDR was telling Crump to you know, order the policing of J.B. Martin. No, I don't think so. However, there are complaints made. And uh, uh, one of the people making a complaint about the treatment here is a good friend of the First Lady, uh, A. Philip Randall. Well, let me first say, okay, there are a couple things here. One, the Department of Justice, uh, uh, on the complaint of Martin and his supporters, opens an investigation. The head of the civil rights section of the Department of Justice wants to prosecute Crump. He thinks he's got a great case because it's obvious. Everybody, even the white papers in Memphis, are condemning Crump for all this. It's just blatant. All right. Uh, So he's got this really good case and he's proceeding, you know, getting ready to move forward. And somebody at the top of the Justice Department stops it cold. Second. Mm thing happens about a year after this a philip randolph the famous black leader uh you know who did the threaten to march on washington he's he's kind of friendly with eleanor roosevelt and he goes to her and said look we got fascism in memphis we got all this stuff happening people can't give you know speeches here it's not just a civil rights issue it's a free speech issue um and he goes to eleanor and he writes her and she doesn't reply for a long time. And when she did, I, I quote the whole letter in my book. I forget the precise words, but it's basically a one, two sentence letter saying, I've been advised that this is, it is better not to look into this. And that was hmm. that. So yeah. I would there was say. kind of top down culture of it's like. It's a culture the, the, and it's complicity. But you're right. Yeah. You know, I can't say that FDR planned this, but it's 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 not looking good. <laughs> in other yeah, uh, let, let, let's talk about this man, Hugo L. Black. Uh, he was be- he's perhaps best known as a Supreme Court justice. But before that, he was an Alabama senator whom you argue kicked off mass surveillance in this country with something called the Black Committee, which targeted opponents of FDR's plan to nationalize utilities like power 
through things like the Tennessee Valley Authority. What aspects of the Black Committee represented a new type of government power or new use of government power in America? Okay, well, FDR's involvement in this is 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 not controversial, although it was not widely known publicly at the time. What is happening? Uh, it, it, okay, at the beginning of Roosevelt's administration, he's very very popular, very high in the polls, gets most of what he wants. But by 1935 or so, there is rising public opposition. This is often a forgotten part of the story. Bert Folsom tells this very well. Um, for example, the Democrats are losing a lot of by-elections, you know, in open seats, including some Democratic seats. Uh, the Democratic State Assembly in, in, uh, in uh, New York goes Republican during this time. May, uh, mayor also, mayor uh, jobs <laughs> are won by Republicans. And Roosevelt's falling in the polls. And again, these are good polls. These aren't the, the kind of polls everybody quotes that got the 1936 election wrong. These are polls that would have gotten it correct. Mm. Um, anyway, falling support for Roosevelt. And they're worried about it. There is one poll in 1936, again, a credible poll, that shows uh, Roosevelt losing in the election. They're, they take this seriously. You could say the polls were wrong or whatever, but the administration takes it very seriously. So the hope is to investigate critics of the New Deal. Uh, and one of the sort of entering wedges is what's going on with this opposition to uh, utility legislation. But it goes beyond that. It becomes a, uh, a sense that we need a general investigation of anti-New Deal organizations what it becomes. All right, so how do they do this? Well, the people in the administration come up with the idea of that we need a committee in the U.S. Senate to investigate lobbies, indirect or direct lobbies. What's an indirect lobby? Well, what we're doing is an indirect lobby. Anything having an influence on public opinion is a part of an indirect mm. lobby. You don't have to go to Washington or anything like that. Climate of ideas. So they set up this committee where the administration orchestrates this, you can see all the correspondence and everything. You say, but who are we, who are we gonna get who do we gonna get to chair this? And they they settle on Black, who was a senator from Alabama, very loyal New Dealer, kind of a Huey Long uh, persona, but a loyalist, right? Not like Long. He was kind of a demagogue demagogue really if you listen to his speeches. But he's very loyal, he's very effective. So they get black. And Black starts to call in witnesses, and they have some success. But they, there's pushback because people are comparing him to, like, the Soviet secret police and stuff. Uh, your method. And, 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 and it's, it's, it's expanding. He's going after all these people. And so somebody comes up with the idea. I don't know who it was. What if we got there the private telegrams of witnesses and were able to hit them with that information without their knowledge, Right. I mean, we could quote the telegram, but, that, but once we got them in there. So that's a big deal. What is the 1930s version of? Yeah, so just to, just to underline that, though, for a second, this is like the equivalent of today, you know, scooping up everyone's emails, uh, which we know has happened. Um, this was kind of the predecessor to that because this is the dominant means of communication was the telegram. Yeah, and they're the like, or... look, uh, these this guy's suspicious. Yeah. Uh, why is he criticizing the New Deal? Is he connected to somebody? Let's scoop up his telegrams all his private communications for this investigation well no, it actually goes even beyond that this is uh uh in some ways uh this is again like you said telegrams are the not only the emails of the time they are the text messages of the time they are over 50 mm percent -hmm. of long distance communication is telegrams and they're instantaneous right just about and a lot of companies have their own telegraphers and so forth and again what do you write in te telegrams it has these are, you know, you don't give them the kind of attention you give a letter. You, you'll let your hair down. You'll say things you wouldn't say otherwise. You don't keep them. People don't keep the uh, generally you know, telegrams. All right. So, OK. So how are they going to get these? Well, there's a law and the law requires telegraph companies. The big one is Western Union to keep copies of all telegrams. All right. We got these copies. We can get access to them. Now, you could sometimes, 
you know, gets access through subpoena purposes. But you have to name, you know, like a specific person, whatever, get, get a court order. They don't do that. What they do is they go initially, the black committee goes to the uh, telegraph company and said, we want Western Union, we want all <laughs> access to all telegrams sent in and outside of Washington, to and from Washington, to every single member of Congress for yeah. a nine-month period. And Western Union says, no, you know, we're not doing that. We're not going to look good to our customers if we do that kind of thing. Well, yeah. goes the FCC. Let's give kudos to Western Union for that, by the way, for the resistance. Yeah, we resistance. give them kudos later, yeah. too, maybe, a little bit. Um, <laughs> and then the FCC orders Western Union to cooperate. Western Union could have probably fought it at that point, but, you know, they don't. So they cooperate. So... Black and his staffer, well, his staffers, not Black specifically. I don't know if he participated in this himself, but his staffers and FCC staffers show up at Western Union and they say, okay, give us all telegrams sending in, in from and to every member of Congress over a nine month period. And they in the period. There's no court order, right? They're just told to do this. And uh, they cooperate. So they go through these big stacks of telegrams, thousands a day. And eventually it goes on and on. It adds up to millions of telegrams they went through. Now, a Black's uh, staffer gives instructions. He says, well, you know, if you see private information, such as uh, stuff about uh, husband and wife, uh, you know, things, because re- people say all sorts of private things in telegrams, like they do in emails. Oh, look past that. Just look for information about lobbying, which, of course, would be anything at all political. They go through this stuff, uh, piles and piles of it, and it's all secret. And they call people in. I think I, I think there's good reason to believe FDR got some of these telegrams. It was, certainly wasn't supposed to. But they were using this stuff, right? In fact, you can go down to the uh, National Archives and get copy. They copied uh, thousands of them. You can get those. Um, hmm. they're, they're sitting there. All right, so they go through this, and then eventually Western Union starts to really get uncomfortable because the search expands. They'll not only say, okay, we want this person's telegrams, this guy in Chicago, and this guy in Los Angeles, and this newspaper editor. We want access to those, too, and they're bringing these out. Western Union, oh, my God. And they start informing people when their telegrams are being searched, kind of informally, because I think they want a lawsuit. And uh, one of the people they inform whose telegrams have been searched is a guy named Newton Baker, who was Secretary of War under Wilson. Very moderate, mild-mannered kind of guy. You know, not a, not a fire breather or anything like that. He is, like, so outraged when he finds this out. He says, if I saw Hugo Black being lynched, uh, 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 you know, I would uh, say... Uh, you know, I would not join the lynching. However, if uh, if they if they were putting the rope around his neck, I would not stop them. Yeah, this is a mild mannered guy. Other people find out. One guy very powerful finds out. Two people very powerful. One of them is a guy named Silas Strong. Any of you know about law? There's a very famous law firm in Chicago called uh, Strong Winston and Strong. Anyway, that's his firm. He was he was the head of the National Chamber of Commerce. He was the head of the American Bar Association and the American Golf Association. So he got a trifecta there. And he was Mr. Powerful. He brings suit because he finds out his telegrams have been looked into, violates his Fourth Amendment violation. They use the term right to privacy all the time, by the way. That's not something that was invented by, you know, in the Roe v. Wade or something. That terminology is used all the time by these people. The right, we have a right of privacy, but Fourth Amendment and so forth. And uh, he wins. Well, he kind of wins. It's a federal court ruling, and they say, we, Congress has great latitude, which is true. They have great latitude in investigations. But we think we got to step in in this one case and stop any more of this. But we can't do anything about what has already happened. Black is upset about this, but then he's, he's already got millions. So he says, okay, we've done our investigation. We're, we're finished with that part. Now we're going to keep using the information. Uh, Hearst, William Randolph Hearst, 
brings a court suit. A he wins as well. Um, because what Black tried to do, there was rising criticism of his committee, so he thought he'd make Hearst look bad. So he releases a private telegram that Hearst sent to one of his editors saying, this guy, this member of Congress, powerful member of Congress, is a communist. We need to look into him. You know, uh, Hearst is a lot like Trump. He is the Trump guy of the 1930s. Mm-hmm. He's very unpopular. But this backfires. He releases this. And there are people like Democratic leaders like Emanuel Seller, who I remember from my youth, he was still around. These are mainstream Democrats are like, what? Mr. Hearst is a citizen like you and me. You're violating his rights. And the Black Committee is being criticized in mainstream publications in a big way. Um, and uh, yeah, let me so, pull up a couple uh, yeah, of the uh, yeah. here's a couple representative headlines that I pulled uh, black terror. And there's a picture of uh, Senator mm-hmm. Black, a free press fights back. Um, and they're talking there in that article specifically about the William Randolph Hearst uh, debacle, his telegrams being taken. It, it uh, You can go through the old newspaper archives and find lots of uh, press outrage. I mean, Part of this, of course, would be the fact that William Randolph Hearst owned a lot of the newspapers. You, you know, you mentioned him as like a Trump-like figure. Uh, like maybe another way to think about it would be like an Elon Musk type, you know, billionaire who owns a large media organization um, who's now at political odds with the administration. Um, it's kind of fascinating to see the pushback. There was then another committee that I think is worth talking about that was uh, headed up by Senator Minton uh, that seemed to take things even a step further than that. Um, What did Minton do um, and and how did he, in a way, go kind of even too far for FDR? Well, why is Minton have to chair of committee? Because Black gets his reward. He's nominated for the Supreme Court. It's quite clear to me that it's because of very loyal service here. By the way, Hmm. Roosevelt's first choice, apparently, according to some accounts, was Minton. Minton was, uh, but Minton turned down one stay in the Senate. Minton is a senator from Indiana, a a freshman, a younger guy. He's in the Senate leadership, the lower rungs of leadership. I think he's assistant whip or something, but it's a very elderly leadership. He's on the rise. He's he's very effective uh, attack figure for the administration and things like court packing. So he is a protege of Black, and he becomes chair of Black's committee, which had gone dormant for a long time. But they ramp it up again after the whole court packing thing goes on Mm -hmm. in 37, 38. Um, and And he can't use telegrams because there's been precedent now. You can't do that anymore. So what does he do? Well, he tries to get things like contributors lists of anti-New Deal organizations. It's a group called the uh, National uh, Committee to Uphold the Constitution. He tries to get their membership lists, their contributor lists. They refuse to cooperate. And and, and interestingly enough, uh, the Department of Justice lawyers say, look, you you know, if you if you try to bring a legal case against this, it's just not going to look good. So, yeah. So, this but again, is a, the insidious the insidious aspect of this is even if it fails, being being a donor to these organizations, knowing that the government is trying to do this, would likely have a chilling effect on donating to such organizations. Yeah. In fact, uh, there's a precedent that comes out of all of this stuff that is used later in the 1950s by the NAACP when the state of Alabama tries to force them to publicly disclose their membership list so that's going to be a chilling effect and it's interesting yeah. provides a precedent for that but uh yeah well okay Minton's frustrated he he's even more frustrated than black so he comes up with the well i think it was suggested to him by all indications by somebody in the administration i think roosevelt but you know mm-hmm. that's just what i think uh, but i think there's reason to, th- to believe that but Mitten then proposes a bill, which very much reflects the administration's views on fake news. It is a bill that Trump kind of supported years ago or suggested, and that is to make it a felony to publish anything in a newspaper known to be false. 
All right. This was the Fel, original Felony. war on fake news. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so Minton proposes this thing as a way to kind of say, I'm frustrated. You know, he, he blames the big media giants, not Hearst so much. Hearst is kind of not as big as he used to be. The big ones are the uh, McCormick and Patterson, so-called Patterson McCormick access. Three really big papers, Chicago Tribune, New York Daily News, and Washington uh, Star Times. I think it's Washington Star Times. Um, Washington Herald, I, I forget. But in any case, um, uh, yeah, he proposes a spill. And he thinks this is just going to be great, but there's immediately massive opposition, including from New Deal publications. It's yeah. almost universal. And he let me pull up some of those headlines because these are interesting to look at too. Like, especially if we're like listening for echoes of like, you know, the fake mm. news, false news comparison. Move made to put cramp on press in the United States. Uh, free speech is being throttled. Minton in an attack on the newspapers. Um, and then this last one is coming, kind of coming from Minton's perspective or explaining his perspective. Minton says papers attack free speech and that he offers a bill to ban false news. Um, this is just a really fascinating kind of the fact that we're almost repeating this era um, is remarkable to me to to see the, those old headlines and, and the way some of these same concerns are resonant today. Yeah, and I couldn't have imagined that when I started writing this 15 years ago, that this would be so timely. I mean, we, for yeah. God's sakes, we have sedition trials now. We have fake right. news. We have all this stuff being talked about, um, um, you know, that 15 years ago was they were not issues in the in the same way uh, in yeah. the same way they are now. Well, anyway, Minton proposes his bill and it's like universal opposition so quick that he has to withdraw. After the opposition has started to assert itself, there's a press conference. Uh, again, these are not recorded or anything, but the, the, the Roosevelt gave one of his you know, regular meetings with the press and he's asked about the Minton bill. And he says in this, he says, uh, well, do you support that? And he said, uh, well, I know one thing. He said that uh, if this bill was actually enforced, we'd have to radically increase the budget of the federal prison system because there wouldn't be enough room for all the prisoners. <laughs> all right. So he jokes, gets a little laugh, doesn't answer the question. And then he, he ends with a little quip. He says, well, you, you boys, meaning the media people there, brought this on you know you boys brought this on so uh again though he has sort of deniability and he uh it, it reflects very much what he you know the kinds of things he likes and mitten is an administration loyalist he's not the kind of guy to go out do this on his own but mitten ends up losing re-election because this is such um has such a negative connotations toward him and he tries to overcome it but he can't really do it but then he comes yeah. back again, where Truman appoints him to the U.S. Supreme Court, where he serves with Black. So, he, so he only only reward only rewarded <laughs> for his kind of failed uh, yeah. or maybe not failed fishing expedition. Um, and you mentioned that what was motivating this was the reaction to FDR's court packing idea, which would be essentially that for every justice over the age 70, he could add another one up to six new justices. And he made this case once again directly to the people through one of his fireside chats. I want to play a clip from that. Uh, this is edited. Uh, this is an edited clip. So he starts off talking about gold confiscation. And then um, I cut to the part where he's talking about court packing and, and how it's related to that. Uh, so let's roll that clip and reflect on it. It's from 19. When I made my first radio report to you, we were then in the midst of the great banking crisis. Soon after, with the authority of the Congress, we asked the nation to turn over all of its privately held gold, dollar for dollar, to the government of the United States. Today's recovery proves how right that policy was. But when almost two years later, it came before the Supreme Court, its constitutionality was upheld only 
by a five to four vote. The change of one vote would have thrown all the affairs of this great nation back into hopeless chaos. In effect, four justices ruled that the right under a private contract to exact a pound of flesh was more sacred than the main objectives of the Constitution to establish an enduring nation. Those opposing this plan have sought to arouse prejudice and fear by crying that I am seeking to pack the Supreme Court. If by that phrase, the charge is made that I would appoint and the Senate would confirm justices worthy to sit beside present members of the court who understand modern conditions, <laughs> that I will appoint justices who will not undertake to override the judgment of the Congress on legislative policy, that I will appoint justices who will act as justices and not as legislators, if the appointment of such justices can be called packing the court, then I say that I, and with me the vast majority of the American people, favor doing just that thing now. So, oh, again, you have clearly. to... That's a, lacking the usual subtlety there. That's about as open as you get, yeah. Yeah, and you have to, mm -hmm. when we're listening to these, it, we have to remember the context, again, that... This is a highly regulated medium with limited access. So, you know, we're now in the age of podcasts where anyone can put out a recording and uh, reach a large audience. That was not the case back then. He was actively working to keep dissenting views off the air and yet had this uh, direct line to the people to spread his unfiltered take on why we need to pack the Supreme Court. Uh, and that it did still ultimately fail, but we see the idea regaining popularity on the left once again. You hear conversations about how we need to, uh, you know, expand the Supreme Court. What what do you make of that fact that that's another echo that we're hearing again here in 2024? I'm very discouraged uh, that you see these and you don't see a lot of pushback on the left. Now, again, the idea seems to sort of died for temporarily but uh yeah let's say you get let's say you get democratic majorities you know i mean under certain circumstances republicans could do this i mean there's there's a willingness to do this there's a, a anything justifies the uh the the ends attitude that you see on both sides now why am i discouraged because fdr much of fdr's opposition came from the left it came from new dealers like senator burton wheeler was a was a key ally of FDR, a lot of people turn against him on the left on this issue. Um, he's really cocky. You can understand why he's cocky, because he won one of the historic landslides in American history. The Democrats they have a veto-proof majority, you know, even forgetting the South. I mean, my God, they're, 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 they're really in the driver's seat, and he must feel like nothing can stop him now except this court which had struck down the National Recovery Administration and the AAA. If I can get them out of the way, I could do a third, third New Deal. And then there's massive opposition, including from a lot of New Dealers. Yeah. So that's what discourages me is that I don't see that kind of civil liberties, suspicion of power, uh, sensitivity that you have then. I don't see that now in, 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 to, to a great extent. And, I, and it I mean, worries it's worth, me. I, yeah, on either side, I, you know, on either side, I don't see that. Yeah, and I mean that that's one reason why I think, you know, your your book's important to reflect on just how close things maybe once got to a very different system of government um with a a, a uh an executive who was consolidate doing everything he could to consolidate power i mean the only thing that got him out of office was death uh like if he was a younger an even younger man when he first came into office like do you think ftr would have just kept going and and going would he have ever stepped down that's hard to say but fdr certainly comes up with the rationalizations um to, yeah. to why he's needed 
and he may believe these himself. But in 1944, he has to know, I guess he's in deniability, but the people around him have to know that this is a dying man, right? Um, and But he runs anyway. Um, so, yeah, I think that that's believable, that he would yeah. find some sort of reason why he's the indispensable man, and he's got to keep He's got to keep running. Over yeah. And, over and um, for the for the final part of this conversation, I want to move to the topic of uh, internment, which is the you know, that's a widely known facet of FDR's time. But what you argue is not widely known is how much he actually had to do with that process. Like it, he's kind of portrayed as like he wasn't quite aware of what was happening or, you know, maybe just not keeping close tabs on it. And it was really the, the department of war that was overseeing that. Um, but bottom line is FDR's administration interned more than 120,000 Japanese Americans. Here's a picture of some of them being loaded onto a train, which was not a good look given what was happening overseas. Uh, talk about the mainstream view of FDR's role in that and why you think it's wrong. Okay. Well, I looked at a lot of history textbooks, and of course, you're not going to find historians that'll say, that's great that FDR did that, right? Uh, I, right. I, you might. They tend to be conservatives. <laughs> Maybe you've kind of found a couple. Yeah, I think Michelle Malkin wrote a book about it. But Yeah, yeah but, was... the, but that's 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 not common. But what they do do is they 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 sort of make it like, well, how could he avoid doing it, right? It's they'll quote public opinion polls, which were taken once it was a fait accompli. There were other polls taken earlier, by the way, that didn't show support for the idea. Uh, they'll say things like he was distracted, that he had a lot on his mind. And I strike this strikes me as ironic because this rationalization comes from the very same people who said FDR is a take charge guy who's very well right. informed. And I think he is. He read several There's... newspapers a day. He was very well informed. Um, and That's he's a getting... contradictory portrait of somebody to be both take charge and hands off in this it... one aspect. Yeah. And it, it, it's a big deal. And it's regarded as a big deal by key advisors of FDR, like Harold Lickies, who opposed it. But more pertinent than that, his two main law enforcement officers, uh, the Attorney General Francis Biddle, who, again, I have some kind words for, I have some negative words, too, but he really held the dam, kept the dam from breaking in a lot of cases. But Biddle opposes Japanese internment and the people, his, you know, people under him oppose it. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover opposes Japanese internment. So FDR yeah. is getting a lot of advice from top people. So it's not like he's being overwhelmed. And there was a poll done by the Office of Facts. Yeah, when, when J. Edgar Hoover is telling you you're going too far, you got to maybe think twice. Uh, yeah, but. I think Hoover, uh, he didn't want that. He didn't want to run that. He didn't want anything to do with it, right? That yeah. was part of it. It's bureaucratic. So, you know, finally, it's like you appease him by letting the army do it. The FBI stays out of that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Uber's an empire builder, but he's he's kind of has an attitude. Of, he's not going to bite off more than he can chew as well. Um, yeah. And I think yeah, there's some civil libertarian aspects there. Maybe I wouldn't overstate it, but but there's but there's all this opposition. But there was a poll done by the Office of Facts and Figures, a government agency, and they found that everybody but 16% uh, of the population were satisfied with the way the uh, government's policy towards Japanese Americans, which was similar, more or less, to its policy to Germans and Italians. Mm -hmm. If they were non-citizens, they were being uh, monitored and so forth. Uh, there were internment camps uh, for Japanese, for Germans and Italians, but they were much, much different. They were geared towards... Uh, non-citizens they were geared to uh, not to the Japanese camps were everybody of Japanese ancestry who was in the designated area which is namely the West Coast where most of them lived uh, they are uh, even if you're in an orphanage there is a it was, it was said the government said basically if, if the orphan is of Japanese ancestry they have to be taken to the camps 
So yeah. that is very. And there was clearly there was clearly some racism at play too. I mean, you pull some really uh, you know horrific comments that FDR was making about Japanese people, and so clearly he had a sort of like racial or ethnic animus to them in particular, as well as the the you know fact that J the government of Japan had uh, bombed Pearl Harbor. Yeah, FDR, a little known fact. In fact, I couldn't find these online. You know, at the beginning when I'm doing research, they were taken down. They were somewhere up online. Uh, you could find them readily. They may be back. But he wrote op-eds for the uh, Macon Daily Telegraph in the 1920s, and he repeatedly discussed Japanese Americans. And he mm -hmm. said, first of all, California's right to prevent them from intermarrying with whites because that will produce offspring which are not desirable. Uh, Japan is right to deny Japanese immigrants land ownership. You, if you were a Japanese immigrant, you couldn't own land. You, basically, they'd find ways around that, have their children, so forth, run it. And, you know, barring immigration, of course. Um, he was, which Uncle Ted had done, right? The gentleman's agreements. He was all... Uh, he was very much his views on that, but he would make these really kind of repulsive jokes like uh, Japan was uh, originally inherited by baboons, but then these, I guess, some prostitutes came there and intermarried, and we all know the result. He'd say things like yeah, that yeah. in private. But um, so there's racism there, I think. There's a lack of sensitivity. It goes beyond racism. There's a coldness yeah. And my example of this is everybody and his brother is urging FDR to close the camps by beginning in 1944. You know, who's who? And uh, he's worried about the election, he says. Yeah, that's And he keeps it there, and that's it, that just removes all defenses. <laughs> I think. Yeah. yeah, I think it's uh, also, uh, I want to examine uh, some of the text of the actual executive order because it's kind of uh, interesting and I think Very useful to look at how these things are actually implemented. It never mentions any specific ethnicity. It doesn't mention Japanese people. This part that I, or Japanese Americans, the, the part that I highlighted here says, uh, I, being FDR, hereby authorize and direct the Secretary of War and the military commanders whom he may from time to time designate whenever he or any designated commander deems such action necessary or desirable to prescribe military areas in such places and of such extent as he or the appropriate military commander may determine from which any or all persons may be excluded. Um I mean, that's the most uh, bureaucratic and also like capacious language. Like you can fit anything inside of that. Uh, like what, what do you think about when you look at the way this order was actually drafted? Yeah, they don't, like you said, they don't mention uh, uh, Japanese Americans, any and all persons who may be excluded. I mean, that's about the, clo okay, how, how's that happen? Well, we're not going to tell you really. So it's, it reminds me a lot of the Constitution's references to slavery. Because slavery mm -hmm. is not mentioned in the Constitution, in the original, you know, document. They'll use terms like all other persons and, you know, persons. It, it's very similar to that. And I called some lawyers. I called Randy Barnett and others. I said, well, why would he do this, right? And I couldn't get a good answer. And it only seems to me that it fits in with a kind of deniability, perhaps, and in fact, right. when the court rules on it, they kind of hook, they, they, it kind of feeds into that. Now, if you want to see specifics in the case of slavery, you go to the slave codes of the states. They're very clear what, who's being talked about. If you look at the actual exclusion orders issued by the military, they use the term persons of, ja all persons of Japanese ancestry. So they're very clear in the enforcement orders, but when the original order very open-ended. And by the way, yeah. worth mentioning that FDR wanted to intern the Japanese in Hawaii as well. He thought that this yeah. order, he wrote it in such a way that it would give him authority to do that. And that didn't happen for some complicated reasons.
talked about. And yeah. it's it's very disappointing to reflect on the fact that the Supreme Court, you know, interceded so late and in such a narrow way that it really had no effect. And like, you know, a recurring theme to me in this book is just the kind of tepid resistance overall to a lot of the extreme overreach and authoritarianism, not only from institutions like the Supreme Court, but from civil liberties group like the ACLU. It's like it comes up time and time again where it's like the ACLU kind of tried but didn't really do much. What, what do you think explains that? Well, let me give you two examples. One big one is Harry Truman. He was asked years later, what about internment? He says, I was against it then, and I'm against it now. It's outrageous. Hmm. He didn't say anything. He was a U.S. senator. The Senate <laughs> right. had a debate time. The only one who spoke up was Senator Taft, who said it was the worst written bill he'd ever seen. But he said, due to the conditions on the West Coast, I'm not going to fight it. But everybody, you know, and there were others like that that later said, I was against it. All right. And but they didn't say anything. So uh, I don't know, just just fear. I mean, there's a um, there's a there, there's people are also very worried. This is a little bit different of being associated with the wrong people. Mm -hmm. And you see this when it comes to the sedition trials. Initially, there's a, this big sedition trial. There's not much criticism. By the end, everybody's against it. But mm -hmm. John Flynn says, you know, I don't like this, but do we you know, it's just not. I don't really like being associated with these people because if mm -hmm. I defend them, I'm going to be associated with them. And who wants to right. take up the cause of these unsavory people? So that so it was kind of a of problem that FDR you know, with the Japanese, was same thing. They'd attacked us and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so it was kind of like, you know, FDR was on maybe would say center left or something that it's kind of a, a weird way to describe it. But then like, the civil liberties people, a lot of them are coming from the left, but FDR is going after people from the right, from the fascist right. And that created some complications in terms of taking a principled stance against what was going on. I think so. And interestingly enough, he also went after the Socialist Workers Party. Uh, right. they, they, they were prosecuted for sedition as well. But that was... Uh, partly because the communists wanted that prosecution because the SWP were Trotskyites and the, the communists wanted to prosecute them for sedition too. Um, but you do see some pushback, more pushback in the media against that because, again, these are people on the left. And there's, right. There's, it tends to be a little bit subtle. easier, yeah. a little bit more palatable to defend. Uh, the, right. Uh, you know, there were some critics at the time, uh, people like Albert J. Nock, who were drawing out the connection between the unprecedented growth of the welfare state under the New Deal and the authoritarianism. That's a connection you don't tend to hear a lot about in history class, but I think it does make some sense when you stop to think about it for a second. Could you channel knock for us and draw that out a bit? Oh boy, it's it's sort of been a while since I've looked at that stuff. But knock is very, uh, 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 you know, very critical of what the administration is doing, um, and um, 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 uh, basically that uh, you know that the New Deal has sort of gotten this hegemony, right? That you have this connection between this 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 welfare state and the use of public funds and that um, you know people sort of become dependent and intimidated there's a very good argument to make that FDR would have won the 1936 election anyway but that a lot of votes were shifted through very strategic use of public money and the line between politics and government was often obscured uh, for example people used to answer the phone at uh, the WPA Works Progress Administration, which was involved in the internment, too. And they would say Democratic headquarters because they <laughs> there was this mix between the public and the private. I mean, do you think that there's validity to that argument that there is a real connection, that it's not happenstance, that the riot, that the rise of authoritarianism and the rise of the New Deal happens at the same time? 
Well, you mean, first of all, I don't think the New Deal is comparable to, you know, to Nazi Germany uh, right. or Italy. Uh, however, there's certainly part of the, there, there's certainly part of a world there, worldview, that free markets have failed, that we need mm -hmm. strong leaders, that we need to solve the problem. The whole, you know, Robert Higgs calls it the do something theory. We need to do something, damn it. You, you see it with the, you know, the rise of communism. You see it with the, uh, uh, you know, the rise of fascism. So there is, you know, a general kind of discontent with uh, markets, with open trade, with, uh, um, 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 you know, um, putting your trust in those kinds of things and, and putting more trust in strong leaders, charismatic leaders. Yeah. And I mean, just to kind of clarify that, I, I wasn't talking specifically about the rise of fascism and communism in Europe, more so about these issues we've been talking about where, you know, FDR was leaning on dissidents or, you know, cracking down on speech. Um, is there some was there any connection to kind of the big government welfare? Did the big the, the the growth of the welfare state in any way either cause that or empower that or make that uh, accelerate the development of of those illiberal trends within the fdr administration oh yeah i mean if you look at the works progress administration relief money uh you can find many cases in these big cities where you know you're being told um you know your job is dependent this money is dependent on you supporting the political machine, which is, you know, the Democratic machine. Um, when uh, A. Philip Randolph, as I mentioned before, actually went, Randolph is a wonderful free speech guy, by the way, doesn't get enough credit for that. He actually went to Memphis and he challenged Crump, but he, he, he was going to speak at a public housing project, a black public housing project. Well, it turns out the guy, African American, who was sort of in charge of that, uh, was just given orders by Crump to deny, deny a meeting space. So you get that kind of thing happening, and I don't think we really have enough research about how uh, the use of government money, the strategic use of government money, um, uh, was a was used to deny people free speech, was used to also intimidate people and silence. Uh, people who might have otherwise dissented. So you I know, think that that's um, a great topic for somebody to look at in more detail. And I have some detail on that, but I, I think I've just scratched the surface. Hmm. Um, to wrap up, just stepping back, when I think about how the New Deal and FDR and this whole era is taught in like high schools, so I'm trying to think back to like my high school history class because mm -hmm. that's when that's for some people that's basically the extent of their thinking about it is what what they get there, and like the broad strokes um, is essentially that FDR brought us historic, you know, heroically brought us out of the depression, ended widespread destitution with the New Deal, and then did what was necessary to defeat totalitarianism overseas. Japanese internment was covered, but more as a wartime excess. Uh, so if you were, you know, helping to redesign the curricula for the layman or for the, the high school student how would you tweak that story or try to deepen uh, the average person's understanding of what unfolded during this era? Yeah, well, I mean, again, uh, this book is not about uh, economics. So somebody could read it. You know, it doesn't deal with why the Depression lasts so long and so forth. But mm -hmm. that would certainly if I was writing a textbook. Uh, I, I would want to talk about that. Previous mm -hmm. depressions in American history are two or three years. This one um, lasts over a decade. Um, so why? You know, what does that say about FDR's uh, leadership ability? So I think that that would be one thing you want to look at. The trouble with history textbook is it's hard to present a nuanced view. Uh, 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 but I think you could certainly point out the contradictions between the four freedoms and Japanese internment, as well as the domestic policy towards uh, towards uh, civil liberties. 
You could look at the darker side of FDR. FDR comes out of a tradition, a progressive tradition, that the ends are what's important. And you find mm -hmm. all sorts of questions. You find people around FDR say this about him, like his own attorney general, not just Biddle, but his other attorney general, that he wanted to get something done and he didn't worry so much about how to do it. Um, you could look at the dark side in terms of uh, Jewish immigration. Much more could have been done to provide a refuge for Jews, uh, not only in the United States, but in other countries. Um, but FDR does not really do much to do that, um, to, to, to facilitate that. So those are issues I'd bring up. Yeah. Uh, the trouble with textbooks is they tended to be distilled down. But I and think how, you want how... to have a more critical perspective here. They at least yeah. give it a little bit more weight than you're giving it. Yeah. I mean, looking at the situation that we're in right now, politically and just American civil uh, civic life, we've talked about some of the echoes that we're hearing from the past now. Having that critical reexamination of FDR and the New Deal, what do you expect that, how do you expect that might improve the situation we find ourselves in right now? Well, I'm an eternal optimist, but I think that FDR is very vulnerable. And why do I say that? Well, first of all, nobody defends Japanese internment, but then they'll come up with these excuses, I guess you could say. But when I confront people, uh, when, when you actually discuss that, those excuses fall apart. Um, mm -hmm. FDR on race, for example. Um, there was all sorts of uh, uh, support for an anti-lynching bill, including from FDR's own conservative Southern Vice President, Garner. Um, but nothing happened. Um, people make the same excuse. Well, he had to get his New Deal thing through. I don't really buy that. Uh, the same thing with the Japanese internment. So I think FDR is vulnerable to criticism. And what I'm trying to do in this book is point to some of those problems, but I think others are doing it too. And I think just a few years ago, Woodrow Wilson was ranked as one of the top presidents. He's not in the top 10 anymore, I think. He's sunk... And I think, I think the same could happen to FDR because he's very vulnerable on many of these issues involving race, for example. Um, that's a big vulnerability. On the left, right? Um, if people point out these things, I, I don't think there's much of a good defense for him on many of these points. The book is The New Deal's War on the Bill of Rights. We've been talking with David Beto. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to Just Asking Questions. These conversations appear on Reason's YouTube channel and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed every Thursday. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and please rate and review the show.